lives who end up getting lost and even dying as a result of their stepping off of an established trail in Yosemite National Park. The subheading read, it, quote, it just takes one misstep for even the most experienced hikers to go missing. The article begins, it's called the cascade effect, a catchy name for the way one mistake leads to another, and a quick explanation for how a hiker who takes one step off of an established trail is one step closer to trouble. Then the article then goes on, park rangers and search and rescue experts say that hundreds of hikers take that one wrong step each year. The key, they say, is where that next step takes them, back toward the trail or further down a perilous path. I believe that was probably a believer that wrote that because we're living in perilous days and he's talking about a perilous path. It's very symbolic of what can happen when one of us steps off of the established gospel trail into some kind of deception. Whether that be a book like The Shack or Jesus Calling, uh, Purpose Driven Life, these, these things can be like one step off of the trail, but then they can be further and further away from the trail. When I read this article, it was very personal because years ago, way back when I was a much younger man, I was cross-country skiing in Yosemite National Park. And I took the established Dewey Point Trail to the end of the uh, edge of the canyon or of the, of the valley. And when I got there, it was a beautiful day. Pine trees were glistening, fresh fallen snow. It was just glorious. And when I got there, a lot of the uh, skiers were just laid out eating their food. And one guy had a topographical map that was laid out. And I was curious. And I went over and I said, what are, you, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm thinking of going off trail and going cross country uh, back to the trailhead at Badger Pass. And I said, what do you do? I was going to check and see if this guy knew what he was doing. He said, I'm a city planner for the city of Santa Cruz. So I'm going, oh, okay, he knows what he's doing. So I said, can I go with you? He said, sure. So 20, 30 minutes later, we set off into the woods, off the trail, headed back to Badger Pass. But the trouble is we got lost. And as afternoon waned and turned into early evening, it was getting really frightening because looking at the map, either we were headed for an old trail that would take us back to Glacier Road and to Badger Pass, Badger Point, whatever, or we were going deep into a wilderness area. We had no provisions, we had no food, we had no sleeping bag. We most likely would have died. We could have been just like the people that this article was writing about. Fortunately, we reached that old established trail and made our way back in the moonlight, back to the main road. But it was a lesson that I felt that I had learned and that I would never do again. And that is putting my trust in someone who seems trustworthy, but really didn't know what they were doing. So years later, I unbelievably made the same mistake spiritually. And it all had to, it all had to do with my fascination with a waitress in a downtown restaurant in Northern California. Having her over to my house one night, she mentioned in the evening's conversation that a friend of a friend of hers was a psychic from Canada and she was coming into town. Would I like to have a psychic reading? And coming from the East Coast, being at least conservative in that respect, I really wouldn't ordinarily do something like that. But my friend was pretty credible, and I was certainly not against winning her favor. So I said, well, sure, yeah, I'll do that. So it was set up, and I ended up seeing the psychic. And as we sat down, and she sort of studied my aura, she got very quiet, and she said, I'm having trouble finding your aura. And I am sitting there going, oh great, <laughs> I don't even have an aura. <laughs> then she said, now I'm seeing it, it's very black. And I'm thinking, could we just go back to not having an aura? <laughs> and she said, wait a second, now it's coming in. 
She said, I can see that you've been very physical and mental in your life, but you've not been spiritual at all. That was very true. I was brought up in a very liberal congregational church. I think they call them Church of Christ today. And we, we went because we had to go. There was nothing really anything remarkable that I remember except the end of the service. So I'm sitting there and suddenly she's telling me things about myself that she had no business knowing. Personal things, things that were happening at work, things that were happening in my relationships or lack of relationships. And she had my attention. I said, this is interesting. Because I didn't know anything about spirit world, seducing spirits, a devil, all that stuff. So midway, maybe towards the end of the reading, I felt a whirling sensation over my head and a, a vibrating, tingling kind of thing on the top of my head. And I was like, what is going on here? Never experienced anything like that in my life. She said, are you aware that there's a ball of light over your head right now? I said, I don't know what it is, but I said, I can feel it. She said, it's a ball of light. And I said, what's it doing there? She said, you have a lot of help on the other side. I said, what's the other side? She said, angels, loved ones that have passed on, spirits that are interested in your well-being. They want to come into your life and help you, but you need to give them permission. So I went, oh, okay, I, I can do that. I was kind of flattered by the whole thing. It was kind of like, I didn't know anybody out there, up there on the other side really cared. So that night, on the flat roof of my house, in, a, in this canyon under a starry night sky, I flashed back on my life, and I really felt that I was about to approach something momentous and really spiritual. And it was, but it was not good, but I didn't know that. So I said, you on the other side, I want to be more spiritual. I want to grow, come into my life. And they did. And what happened is my spiritual life started to take off like a rocket ship. And all sorts of things started happening. Now I want to stop for just a second and just list number one device used by the devil is to have us put our trust in people rather than the word of God. I didn't know the word of God. I trusted my friend. I trusted that she was sort of more advanced spiritually and that she knew what she was doing. And besides, I wanted to ingratiate myself to her. So that's the device. And that would apply also to your Aunt Mary, who's been a Christian for 30 years and who just told you that she loves the shack. And you're thinking, Aunt Mary really loves Jesus. She's been going to church for years. She knows her Bible. I guess I should read The Shack. It must be a good book. Not necessarily. You need to check everything. Acts 17.11. Search the scriptures daily to see if what you're being told and what's being said is true. But... If you trust your Aunt Mary and you don't really know that much about how you can be deceived, it's easy to fall into that. A lot of people did. Same thing with the book Jesus Calling. Second device is putting unwarranted trust in spiritual experiences. So in the church today, a lot of people are getting spiritual experiences. Uh, hyper-charismatic movement is filled with them. Holy laughter was, so-called holy laughter, was one of the first ones to arrive on the scene. Way back in the mid-90s, people would fall down laughing hysterically, convinced that God was laughing through them. I don't think God's laughing at what's going on today. Rodney Howard Brown, the Holy Ghost bartender, so-called, that brought this movement in, has gone through the years, kind of uh, repackaged himself, and was recently, or not fairly recently, in the White House, laying hands on the president. That's the way it is. There just doesn't seem to be any major discernment in Christian leadership. 
So the scripture for putting trust in people rather than the word of God is from Micah 7, 5. Trust ye not in a friend, put ye not your confidence in a guide. You need to be really careful who's leading you, who's guiding you. Now, there's a lot of pressure being put on people today to hear the voice of God. Jesus' calling has inspired that. If you go online, you can find over 50 books that will be about how to hear the voice of God, how to discern the voice of Jesus. I have yet to see one of them that says to test the spirits, 1 John 4.1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but test the spirits, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. A lot of people are listening to voices that are not, from the Lord. They're seducing spirits, 1 Timothy 4.1. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So these experiences that people are being pressured to have, uh, those at Bethel Church up in Reading, uh, the Jesus Culture group that came out of there had a, had a big um, seminar all-day seminar at UC Davis, and it was called One Encounter Can Change Everything. If you're listening to a voice that's not the Lord, you're going to hear things that are not scriptural. And the way things are going right now, it looks like they're trying to give new revelation, a new spin, a new twist on the old gospel. It's like the old gospel is becoming a new gospel. And the new gospel says that God is in everyone and everything. We're all one because we're all connected, because we're all God. And because we're all God, it says, the new age says, we can recreate the future. We can, we can change the book of Revelation. We don't have to have Armageddon. We can have an alternative to Armageddon we can have a planetary Pentecost. We can have a planetary revival. I believe that's what we're on the cusp of, is a revival that's going to look like it's coming from God, but it's not going to be. It's going to be probably in conjunction with a, a peace movement of some sort, and it will be something that will look like world peace is being brought about by a major planetary Revival, but it will be everything that the Bible warns about. Daniel in uh, Daniel 8, 25, talking about Antichrist, says that by peace, he, Antichrist, shall destroy many. A peace plan. In uh, Daniel 8, 24, he says that he will destroy wonderfully. It's going to look good. Who, does, who doesn't want world peace? But on what terms and, and, and what, what compromises have to be made? And I suggest that the leaven, the compromise that will be made, is the acceptance into the church, the apostate church, that God is in everyone and everything. Again, if you can get that booklet, Be Still and Know That You're Not God, you'll see how many different places this idea of God in everyone and everything is laid out in so-called Christian books. In regards to another experience from the other side, this idea that loved ones want to communicate and help us to get through this experience on earth. A pastor in Leapers Fork, Tennessee, by the name of Steve Berger, wrote a book called Have Heart. And in that book, he documents how he and his wife and his church have been in contact with their deceased, his deceased son, Josiah. It basically legitimizes necromancy. We are not to communicate with the dead. That's made very clear throughout Scripture, particularly Leviticus, uh, Acts 16, 16, Paul and Silas cast out 
a divining spirit that is in the damsel, the Philippian, Philippian psychic. They're thrown in jail. They're basically, they're basically thrown in jail because they busted the local psychic. And the local psychic can no longer do her readings because it wasn't her gift. It was a divining spirit. The trouble with Berger's book, besides the obvious, is that it was endorsed by a number of Christian leaders, including Greg Laurie, including the author of The Shack, including James Robeson, which again goes back to the device of seeming, things seeming to be legitimized by somebody who you would ordinarily would respect and would think they would know better. So that's why we have to be so dependent on God's word and on the Lord and not on our favorite teacher, not on our favorite book, but we need to be measuring everything. Uh, Acts 17, 11, searching the scriptures. And I'm sure that Steve, your pastor, would say the same thing about what he teaches, that you need to be really careful about those things that he says and make sure you're measuring them by the word of God. So put, putting unwarranted trust in spiritual experiences and unwarranted trust in, in uh, people. The other thing that can happen, happened to me, which was meant to be experiences. We, we talk about there's a reason for everything. Uh, it was meant to be. Uh, it's no accident. And the implication is that events have conspired in such a way that God's trying to tell you something. Well, after the psychic experience, that New Year's Eve, I went down to Big Sur for, for a New Year's Eve, uh, special New Year's Eve with my girlfriend at the time. Checking into the bookstore at Nepenthe down there in Big Sur, I saw a book by an Indian master called Journey Toward the Heart. And I really thought that this book would help me be more spiritual. And so I got the book. I never heard of the author. His name was Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. He actually was an Indian guru in an ashram in India, but I just they described him as an Indian master. So I went to the cash register, bought the book, and asked the guy, can you tell me a good place to stay here tonight? He said, sure, Deachin's. He said, but you gotta be careful because the guy that runs the place has to really like you for you to stay there. And I went, well, that's kind of strange. And he goes, yeah, but you're cool, it'll work. So went down to Deachin's, the owner came out. There were a bunch of cabins at the base of a mountain and he had us look at cabins. We picked one out, came back. Then he took a deep look into my eyes. And he said, how would you like to stay on top of this mountain tonight? I said, whoa, sure, okay. It's New Year's Eve, that, that sounds good. So it's sunset on New Year's Eve with the sun flickering through the trees. His driver named Orion, like the constellation, drove us up this windy road to a lodge that sat on a mountaintop that actually was looking down on clouds from horizon to horizon. It was like being in heaven. I've never seen anything like it before or since. Walked up to the top of this lodge, to the room that we were given, with my Rajneesh book in hand, never heard of the guy before, sitting on the bedside table was a book called Only One Sky by Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. And I just kind of went, whoa, whoa, this is too much. I, I guess this is my next spiritual experience. Well, it was, but it was contrived by the forces that be to take me deeper into my deception. So the device is when circumstances contrive to make it look like something is from God, you need to ask another question. If this is a meant to be experience, meant to be by whom? God, deception, just chance? And in this particular case, 
uh, it took me further and further into the New Age deception because I started reading the books and I started learning about all sorts of spiritual principles that were contrary to Scripture. In other words, you don't need a savior. You save yourself by recognizing that you're a part of God. By recognizing that you're a part of God, you awaken to that realization that you are God. And as God, you join with others to recreate the future and to create world peace. That's where everything's at right now. And that's where it's going in the church also. One of the other devices, uh, this doctrine of oneness, is, was first introduced uh, publicly in a book called The Aquarian Conspiracy by Marilyn Ferguson. It was basically a trumpet blast by the New Age saying, ready or not, here we come. We have a great ha-ha heretical idea God is in everyone, and we're going to whip it on you. And you may laugh at us now, but this heresy is going to become the new gospel, the new age, new worldview in the future, and it largely has. Its chief proponent, in terms of promoting it, has been Oprah Winfrey. She's endorsed a set of teachings called A Course in Miracles. How many are familiar with A Course in Miracles? Okay, not too many. A Course in Miracles was reputedly channeled from Jesus Christ to a woman in New York City in the 1960s. The teachings that came down were the Bible upside down. But for those of us who didn't know Scripture, we, didn't, we had no idea. Here are some of the teachings from this Jesus. A slain Christ has no meaning. The journey to the cross should be the last useless journey. Do not make the pathetic error of clinging to the old rugged cross. There is no sin. There is no devil. And once again, you save yourself by recognizing that you are God and everyone and everything else is God. It's all one. Well, that sounds pretty preposterous to a well-educated church. But to someone like myself, I didn't know. I just thought this was, this is Jesus. But yet the real Jesus said, take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Well, guess what? That was supposedly Christ. That was supposedly Jesus. And he's delivering doctrines of devils. This isn't lightweight deception. This is blasphemy. Okay, so, so what, what's the big deal about A Course in Miracles? So you read it, so what? Well, in 1992, when my book, The Light That Was Dark, was about to be published, it was in the process of being edited to be published by Moody Press, a woman by the name of Mary Ann Williamson wrote a book called A Return to Love, Reflections on the Principles of A Course in Miracles. Oprah Winfrey had this woman on her program, and Oprah said, this is one of the best books I've ever read, and the principles of A Course in Miracles can change the world. She said, if it looks like I'm trying to hype the book, I really am. She said, I bought a 1,000 copies, and I'm handing them out to everyone in my studio audience. The false Christ of the New Age was just publicly mainstreamed into four million households across the nation. Oprah Winfrey's Christianity is the Christ of the New Age, the Christ of A Course in Miracles, a slain Christ who has no meaning, where the cross means nothing, where there's no devil. And she gets very incensed if somebody suggests that her Christianity is not biblical, and that she's new age. Well, for some reason or another, this has just not really been widely publicized within Christian leadership. The one person that really got it and did something about it was, 
I don't know if you remember on the 700 Club years ago, Ben Kinchlow was the African-American guy that worked with Pat Robertson. And uh, in 1993, they had me on that program with my book, The Light That Was Dark. And I talked about The Course in Miracles. And Ben Kinchlow picked up that book, The Course in Miracles. He said, people, I've read this, and I can feel the evil that's in this book. This is a terrible book. And I've never heard really hardly anybody in Christian leadership talk about this false teaching, false Christ, the fact that Oprah has done everything she can to promote New Age teachings that all are basically the same as the Course in Miracles. It's called the New Age Doctrine of Oneness. It's in opposition to the doctrine of separation. The false Christ of A Course in Miracles says that recognition of God is the recognition of yourself. There is no separation between man and God. So separation is a negative teaching within the New Age. In other words, if you don't recognize that you're God, you're hurting the body of God that is humanity. I, I used to give the example um, of the Christmas tree at the White House. Um, at Christmas time, the president would throw the switch and the whole tree would light up. Some of you that have been around a few Christmases might remember that if one of those little bulbs didn't work, it short-circuited the whole tree. It just didn't light up. What the New Age Christ is saying is that those who do not accept their oneness with God are into separation. They don't believe that they're one with God. And what they do is they hinder the body of God, which is humanity, from operating properly, spiritually. And they need to be healed or eliminated. Now, that's pretty heavy, and that's pretty, pretty serious. And it is. And I think we forget that with the good news of the gospel comes the reality that Jesus warned us about. He said, they hated me, they're going to hate you. They persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. And this persecution is revving up because there's a lot of pressure coming from New Age leaders that if you don't get with this teaching, if you don't, quote unquote, awaken to this new understanding, then you're like a cancer cell in the body of God and you're short-circuiting the ability of God to function properly. I go into much more detail in my book, False Christ Coming, Does Anybody Care? And I'm not trying to get too heavy here, but at the same time, we're just not looking at some of these scriptures. Jesus said, they called me Beelzebub, Satan. They're going to call you Beelzebub, Satan, too. The New Age Christ says that the only devil are those that are into separation. Separation is an illusion, he says. Separation is a sin. Separation is a crime. It's, 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 it's a bad phrase. So then we have the author of The Shack appearing on TBN on his series, Restoring the Shack, and he's talking about separation, the lie of separation. And he's introducing everything that I just mentioned to you. So while I, I take the risk of injecting heaviness into the congregation and talking about this, someone could sit there watching Paul Young, William Paul Young on TBN and not know that he's outing one of the most incredibly blasphemous teachings to come into the world and trying to sneak into the church about separation. It's this oppositional doctrinal oneness versus separation. If you're into oneness, it's kind of like mom and apple pie. If, if you're into separation, it's kind of like the Grinch who stole Christmas. It's like, which one do you want to be? Do you want to be in love, happiness, and oneness? Or do you want to be in hate, criticism, and separation? Uh, well, I'm into love. Um, well, we have to get clear on our terms. When we hear things being mentioned, we have to be really clear on what we're hearing and what they, what they mean. I'll give you a quick example. 
The term God's dream is a term that was introduced in a New Age theosophical magazine back in 1916. It's a term that's used by many in the New Age, including the false Christ Maitreya, who claims to be here on earth right now, waiting for humanity to call him forth. And God's dream is one for humanity to achieve world peace and oneness. That's God's dream, the New Age. Unfortunately, if you Google God's dream, the first probably 150 references you'll see come from the Christian church. Rick Warren calls his peace plan God's dream for you and the world. God's dream is used by just, well, it's used by uh, Bethel Pastor Bill Johnson, Shaq author William P. Young, Kenneth Copeland, Brian McLaren, Pope Francis, Joel Osteen, Sarah Young, Leonard Sweet, Mark Batterson, Joyce Meyer, Ravi Zacharias, and countless others. These overlapping terms blend into each other, and we start to accept things. Rick Warren, in particular, has made a point of really pushing God's dream. He did a booklet just a couple years ago called God's Dream for Your Life. God doesn't dream. God does. God is. This, this is a, a, a manufactured term to kind of bring the world and the church together. I believe it's Satan's ultimate scheme, God's dream. It's going to be the slogan that is going to be used to try to unify not only the world, but the apostate church, which is gathering forces as we speak. So keep, keep that to me, that's one of the strongest devices that the enemy has right now, the, the terminology, oneness, separation, God's dream, uh, putting your trust in people rather than the word of God, going with spiritual experiences. It feels good, says the gal who said Jesus was holding her hand in church last week, got an email last week. Jesus was holding her sister's hand in church. What do I do? How do I talk to my sister? I'll have her test the spirits. Have her pray and say, Lord, if this is not you, take it away. It's gone. But we're not doing that. We're putting so much pressure on people in the church to have a spiritual experience, to be hearing from Jesus, hearing from God with no warning about, to, not to, about testing the spirits. And that's the device, not testing the spirits. It's a new story. You heard the term new narrative. It's, really, it's all over the place. New story, new narrative. And yet, Scripture warns in uh, 2 Peter 1.16, for we've not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Cunningly devised fables, like we're all one, like God's dreaming, and he has a dream of world peace, and that we're all one with him. But well, sounds good, it would be nice, it just isn't true, it's not scriptural. We're warned quite the opposite. We're warned that the world's going to go astray and there's going to be a lot of hard times and that Christians will be persecuted for what they stand up for. In the future, we could end up with a book like The Message being the go-to Bible as they outlaw authorized Bibles as being hate literature. We're not that far away from stuff like that happening. The Jesus of A Course in Miracles, the New Age Jesus, says that all of humanity is asleep and dreaming that we need to awaken to the truth of our oneness. How is that done according to the Jesus of A Course of Miracles? Well, God has a dream, and he's going to enter our dream with his dream. This is all laid out in A Course of Miracles, the Jesus that Oprah Winfrey has pushed on the world. God's dream is not just some cute little phrase. It's a device that's being used to bring the world and the church together. Interestingly, I've noticed the term God's dream has been popping up a lot more in Pope Francis's writings. He's using that term, God's dream. Pope Francis also said that we need six new Beatitudes, one of them being that God is in every person. It's also in the Catholic Catechism. This is all kind of sneaking in because, unfortunately, we have kind of these unknown voices like 
Johanna Michelson, Carol Matriciana, Ray Youngin, Larry DeBrien, Dave Hunt, Brian Call, that are trying to get this warning out. But Christian leadership just doesn't seem to want to go there. They want to have revival. They want to have holy laughter. They want to excuse Rodney Howard Brown for bringing holy laughter into the church and maybe even legitimize it. It's, it's pretty unbelievable. 1 Corinthians 14.8 says, If the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for the battle? Well, we're not getting the warnings. And those of us that are trying to warn are pretty much getting marginalized and suppressed. If you try to sound the alarm in Zion, you're called an alarmist. If you try to critique unscriptural teachings, you have a critical spirit. If you try to expose heresy, you're a heresy hunter. The most unreasonable thing I've heard in a long time came from uh, Christian leader Francis Chan recently. He said that the Holy Spirit is in every Christian who is the temple of the Holy Spirit, the temple of God. If you say anything about another Christian, you are taking a, quote, sledgehammer to the body of Christ. In other words, don't you dare say anything about false teachings because you're taking a sledgehammer to another Christian. This is an incredible device being used by the enemy to suppress any kind of reasonable discussion of what's going on. This is how far it's gone. Anybody watch the royal wedding? Probably quite a few of, if you haven't seen it live, okay. Tehar de Chardin is acknowledged to be the father of the New Age movement. He was a Jesuit Catholic priest who was defrocked by the Catholic Church. He's a hero of the, of the New Age movement because he has teachings like these. Quote, a religion of the future is a religion of evolution and cannot fail to, it cannot fail to appear before long as a new mysticism. The cross still stands, but this is on one condition and only one that it expand itself to the dimensions of a new age. A general convergence of religions upon a universal Christ who fundamentally satisfies them all seems to be the only possible conversion of the world. Teilhard de Chardin is the father of the New Age movement. Right in the middle of the Episcopalian priest's presentation of the gospel, talking about love, talking about the energy of love, he hailed Teilhard de Chardin as a great mind, one of the greatest minds of the 20th century. Leonard Sweet, a renowned Christian leader who has a book called Quantum Spirituality, calls Chardin 20th century Christianity's major voice. If you go back and look at the transcript of that Episcopalian priest's talk about love, Martin Luther King, civil rights movement, the energy of love, right in the middle of it is Teilhard de Chardin, the father of the New Age movement. Things like that are just sneaking in. Perhaps what troubled me even more was that Ravi Zacharias, who's a renowned, reputed Christian teacher, went on his blog this week and said that, that Episcopalian priest's presentation of the gospel was really good. He said, he made you focus on every word, like Tehar de Chardin. What troubled me was that Ravi Zacharias edited the New Age section of Walter Martin's Kingdom of the Cults, exposing the New Age. I mean, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't grasp that he's hearing Chardin's name in the middle of that and then praising it as a really good presentation of a gospel about love. These things are slipping by. We don't need to be experts on deception. You don't need to go read a bunch of occult books. God's assigned that to a number of us. <laughs> and we've sort of taken on that charge. Uh, it's not the most fun ministry in the world, but um, 
it is necessary because this stuff is happening so quickly. There is a simplicity in Christ. There's a simplicity in the deception. If you understand oneness versus separation, God's dream is going to bring oneness into play. Those who don't get it are going to be into separation and they need to be dealt with. That's the framework for future persecution, whether that starts happening next week, next year, or somewhere down the line. It's all being laid out. We've watched this thing for a long time. Came to the Lord in 1984. The new age has kind of repackaged itself as the new gospel, the new spirituality. It doesn't, it knows that the new age was critiqued and criticized, so it hides under these other labels. Um, but it's still, by any other name, it's still the new age. So with that wonderful, heavy news, the good news is that God has told us about all of this ahead of time. You know, he, he has warned us. If you look carefully through the Bible and particularly through the New Testament, warning after warning after warning after warning, in Philippians 3, I think it is, first verse in one of the chapters says, Rejoice. And then the next one says, Beware of dogs. So I always thought a good sermon would be, Rejoice and beware. We are to rejoice. We are to be joyful people. We, we have the Lord as our Savior. You know, we know where we're going. We have the truth. But there's this reality of what's going on in front of our eyes especially like this royal wedding just brought it home so clearly. Father of the New Age movement dropped right in the middle of this presentation of the gospel and then lauded by one of our Christian leaders as a great presentation. He hung on every word. The only thing that you can do is to be prepared yourself so that when somebody approaches you with one of these books or with a teaching or something, you can do what the Lord did. You can ask good questions. You, you don't retreat and go, well, I heard Jesus Calling is a bad book. That's not going to work with most people. Hey, did you know in Jesus Calling that on page 199, Jesus says, I am above all as well as in all. Did you know that in the message translation of the Bible, that in the Lord's Prayer, Eugene Peterson put the phrase, as above, so below? Did you know that that's an occult New Age phrase that goes back several thousand years? It's the heart of the New Age. What's that doing there? Uh, I don't know. I didn't know that. Again, we don't need to be experts, but the reason that a lot of us have written booklets and books and just to kind of come to a bit of a conclusion because I could have you all low crawling out of here. <laughs> And it's just like, oh, that was a really good talk. Yeah. I think I'm going to go home and take a nap for about five hours. Well, part of what we do is we overcompensate for what's not being said. I don't know, for lack of a better way of putting it. And when you only have an hour, I want you to understand that these things are happening. Because Johanna Michelson wrote The Beautiful Side of Evil, a book by a Christian woman who had been involved in the occult, when we were at the height of our New Age journey, becoming teachers, having workshops, we suddenly had to deal with something that seemed evil, seemed oppressive. But there was no evil in the New Age. There is no evil. You just project your own fears out into the universe. When you get your fear, fear of being God, there's a good one, their fear of God is the fear of not recognizing that you are God. You get that? I mean, it's really insidious. So none of our solutions worked, and we were at a loss. And we had this presence that was just harassing, particularly my wife, girlfriend at the time. So in desperation, I was at a secular bookstore in Hermosa Beach, California. And I saw this book called The Beautiful Side of Evil in the New Age section. I wasn't looking in Christian section. And I pulled the book down and I started reading. I went, wow, this woman's been through the same stuff we have. This is really interesting. I sat down on the floor and started taking notes. As I was taking notes, a homeless mentally ill guy that I'd seen on the street days before 
came into the bookstore back to where I was writing and started screaming at me, are you going to buy that book? What are you doing with that book? And I just kind of went, oh my, does, does evil know that I'm reading about it? Can, can evil orchestrate a man right off the street to come back and try to harass me? Yes. Wow. I, I've been a lifetime social worker, so I, I dealt with a guy humanely, reasonably, and he left. I wrote down her solution to dealing with this presence. It sure was different. The next day, when this presence manifested again, this oppression, I told Joy, I said, let's go out in your mom's backyard. We were staying at her mom's house. I want to try something different. Reading exactly what Johanna had in her book. I said, Satan, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I forbid your presence here. I call upon the blood of Jesus Christ. The Lord, take you to wherever he would will you to go. And phew, that presence was gone. Joy said, it's gone. I said, wow, something must have happened on that cross at Calvary where evil was defeated, and we're calling upon that victory. I think we need to start reading the Bible. So you'd think that night we'd go home and drop down and ask the Lord to be our Savior. When you're in the New Age, you're really deceived. It took us a number of months before we actually made that complete surrender. But we started reading the Bible, and we started realizing that the New Age was the Bible upside down, all in the name of love, peace, happiness, and forgiveness. The devil knows how to mix truth with error. And just because a teacher, I don't care who it is, including your own pastor, if he mixes error in there, and I've never seen Steve do that, but he'd, again, be the first one to tell you to check whatever he's saying, it's all error. Harry Ironside, a really well-known pastor uh, at Moody Memorial Church years ago, said that any combination of truth and error is all error. It's an ungodly mixture. It needs to be repudiated, and it's basically heretical. It's what, you know, what we're warned about is being heresy. So I just want to read in conclusion um, from the light that was dark. I said, we realized something very mysterious had happened on that old rugged cross that a whole new age was doing hand over head flips to completely avoid. It was the victory in Jesus that A Course in Miracles was desperately trying to redefine and explain away. It was the amazing grace that had saved the likes of Joy and me. Finally, after all we'd been through, I was starting to see that the heart of the gospel is not so much that God helps those who help themselves, but rather that God helps those who can't help themselves. It was not in affirming our strength, but in recognizing our weakness that we'd finally learned to ask the Lord for help. It was his grace, not our own self-sufficiency, that had saved the day. Yet though we Yet even though we had recognized our need to be saved from the evil that was coming at us, we had stubbornly refused to acknowledge Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. Clinging tenaciously to our metaphysical identities, we hadn't understood that our faith ultimately had to be in Jesus, not in ourselves. And that Jesus meant it when he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We'd put our faith in ourselves as God and not in God as God. By going within, we'd gone without. We had grossly underestimated our ability to not be deceived, and we had grossly overestimated the wisdom of our metaphysical teachers. Jesus said deception would be the primary sign before his return. Folks, we're there. We're there, and just be grateful that you're in a church that loves the truth. You guys wouldn't be here if you didn't love the truth. And uh, it's going to be really important for all of us to be able to tell people, probably one of our most important witnesses in the future is going to be saying, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not subscribing to the doctrine of oneness. I want peace, but Jesus is our peace. The Bible warns about peace and safety, but then destruction comes. Daniel warned about how Antichrist will bring a deceptive world peace. We're on the way to that. The timing is the Lord's. We need to be prepared uh, for whatever. He, he, the Lord could arrive tomorrow. Uh, we can have even more deception than we've already got coming next week. But the one thing that we have is we have the word of God and, it, and the Lord magnifies his word above his name. Well, I don't believe that the Bible is completely true. It needs, no, it doesn't need anything. It's, it's sufficient. And it saved two people, my wife and myself, that were just hopelessly lost.
thinking that we were really on the track to something that was going to save the world and bring peace to the world. So I just want to thank Pastor Steve and you guys for having me. I'm sorry that it's a little bit on the heavy side, uh, but it's the reality. Uh, if you look at what the disciples went through, it wasn't always an easy journey. And I'm sure that each one of you has your own story of things that are going on in your life. But God is with us. He'll never leave us, never forsake us. And um, we just thank God we have a Savior. The world needs that Savior. If there's anybody here today who has not asked the true Christ, Jesus Christ, into their life, I just would tell you that's the best thing you can ever do. When I was in college, Campus Crusade for Christ came into our house. To our horror, we were going to go out drinking. And these three guys came in, and we were just really upset. And two guys gave their testimony, and we just went, yeah, sure, right. The third guy said, what have you got to lose by asking Jesus into your life tonight? I didn't hear anything else. I didn't repent. I didn't do anything. But I said, Jesus, if you're out there, please come into my life. I'm convinced that even though I didn't get saved at that moment, I didn't get born again at that moment, I asked him into my life, and he kept me from going to India. He kept me from becoming a channeler. He got me out of the New Age. He brought Johanna's book into our life. And I just would urge anyone here that's never really asked the Lord into their life seriously to do that. And the best thing is to repent of your sins and the rest of it. And I'm sure there's lots of people in this church that can help you if you need some uh, guidance on how to, how to be born again. Jesus said, marvel not that I said you must be born again, John 3, 7. So thanks again. And maybe we can uh, close in prayer, stand in prayer, and uh, maybe the worship team can come forward. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your, for your word. We thank you that you sent a Savior into the, a lost world. And boy, were we lost, Lord. And you, you sent Johanna Michelson's book just at the right time. And uh, you are bringing truth to people who want truth. It says that those who do not have a love of the truth um, are the ones that are going to fall and become a part of this apostate church. Lord, we want to stand. We want to fight the good fight. We want to be contending for the faith and not pretending in the faith. We want you to lead us and to guide us in everything that we say and do. And we just thank you so much, Lord, for giving us your word and, and your son, Jesus Christ. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.